Hello, everyone, and welcome back. My name is Luis, and I am the program manager of Polkadot Basecamp. We have Marco again with us here in the GameDAO Fireside chat. You already heard some things about Marco and about some things about GameDAO, but I'm sure you want to hear more, and we're going to hear more very soon. How are you doing today, Marco? Yeah, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, the previous panel was really fantastic to have uh, such high caliber um, yeah, conversation partners. And uh, actually, I gained some really new insights into the world of Animoca brands and YGG. Pretty, yeah, pretty it, was, it was very good indeed. And I would like actually to touch onto some of the points that you discussed there to, to expand of those. But before that, a disclaimer for everyone, by the way. So I have, I have known Marco for a bit now. And I would say that he's a real advocate of the centralization, Web3, and the whole collaboration that this brings up. So it might be that by the end of this panel, actually, we're all starting a revolution if we let him talk. So let's see how this brings us. But um, I think before we get into that, it would be great if you could tell us a little bit more about GameDAO. And I think you have actually prepared a presentation for that. Yeah, actually, I did uh, in a traditionally suboptimal manner because I'm well known for my horrible presentation style. But I have prepared something for you. Let me quickly share this. Here we go. Can you see it? I guess so. Yes, we can. <clears throat> yeah, so just some little background. Uh, I started uh, somewhere in the early 80s with computing things, uh, mainly did computer graphics. Uh, yeah, had at a certain point in time Commodore 64, where we did like, uh, yeah, internet things. Uh, back then it was BBSing with acoustic coppers into <laughs> other computers. And end of the 80s, I started uh, actually creating computer games uh, with some friends. So we basically replicated, uh, yeah, well-known games back in the day, like uh, Super Mario, Giant Sisters, and so on. And um, over the time, I went through a lot of different um, yeah, industries, started a couple of like uh, design studio where I co-worked with people, later on moving into the startup area where we supported um, yeah, early stage and late stage, spin off, spin outs, and so on. And uh, with emerging crypto, of course, for me, it was like the ultimate dream coming true because finally we could uh, reach something or work on a state where we create really open markets where everybody can equally participate. And maybe at a certain point in time, would be able to integrate this into video games. But uh, actually, it took quite a bit of time. And uh, so I went uh, through a couple of detours, uh, including uh, working with um, regulated uh, companies to learn more about uh, these things and afterwards reasons like uh, how can we bring all of this into a reasonable context for games, uh, which is of course sometimes pretty boring. And uh, that's why we came up with GameDAO. It's more like uh, initially it was a thesis of how we can bring like financial primitives uh, into the video game space, but also with certain types of security or safety guards. Uh, especially looking into the traditional world of gaming where um, the developers are mostly pretty traditional and not risk takers like most of the people who are moving around in Web3. So if you look into this, um, I have some like uh, a bit technical charts. I'm sorry for that. Um, so if you look at the entire video games industry, just to run through that, uh, it's, it's of, of course, it's pretty big and it's not comparable to uh, blockchain gaming, which is just happening on another level. But uh, this is all based on super centralized technology, uh, fundraising, ownership, as we learned even before in the panel. And uh, now through Web3, with all these new primitives, people are empowered, the community is empowered, uh, and even the creators are empowered to create new styles of business models where everybody can participate equally and contribute, for example, liquidity to something and get a return for that. Or for example, in, in case of gaming, uh, the first time, ever really play to earn or play to own in-game items. And what we are working on in general is more like to take this one step further. And that's why I pretty like the narrative we had before with beyond play to earn. Uh, actually, we want to combine all of these primitives uh, and go one level deeper. So not really on the asset class of portable in-game items, which can be collectibles and so on and accrue value, but mainly to do something like this, where you have like an end-to-end -end solution for the Web2 world to move into Web3 or to Web3 people to build on more robust protocols, which are, and that's to, to jump back <laughs> again, 
into uh, what we discussed before. I had this uh, question about, um, for example, uh, about uh, sentiment in the market of Web2 people and about regulation. And what we are trying to achieve really is with GameDAO to have like all of these innovative protocols, but to make them enable for more traditional people. And this is kind of like a challenge for us we're taking on. Um, yeah, that's, uh, now I said a lot without saying a lot. Uh, so what we really do with GameDAO is uh, we offer uh, protocols to build DAOs. So GameDAO itself is a DAO uh, governed by the community and the community is capable through staking certain types of assets uh, to create a DAO inside of it. So it's like a nested DAO and create fundraising campaigns, for example, inside of it for their individual projects they try to build. So in the best case, video games. And um, essentially uh, the whole process, why it's maybe interesting is that the community is fully integrated in, not only in the fundraising, but also into the governance of the funds which are raised. This means instead of like having like a black box uh, where somebody receives some funding and maybe he or she or they deliver something the community is always full like fully integrated into the whole process and can even uh, support decide uh, in our case even rage quit out of a campaign at a certain point if somebody doesn't deliver and this increases of course like the quality of things which are built but um, also pays into like um, the longevity of games that's a rough overview of that, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Marco. That that was a great in, uh, introduction. And, and by the way, one question, was that you in the picture that you showed actually? Uh, yeah, yeah, this uh, old school skunk work style picture. It's uh, on the left, it's me. Um, <laughs> I, I still don't, and now I don't drink so much uh, Coca-Cola anymore, but uh, on the right side, it's uh, one of my like old friends uh, from back in the days, Jan Klose. Uh, he's still running uh, game studios. Um, yeah, as I said, like I, I went through a couple of detours, but essentially come back now to to support the industry with the best I can. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So I, I can see that you are a gamer. I'm actually a gamer myself as well. Um, but you are also a game creator. So it would be interesting to to know as well. Wh when is the moment? So what's the epiphany that you had to decide? Okay, I need to create something like Game Now. At the end. Um, if you look at gaming in general, uh, you always have the same sort of say problems if you grow up. So in the be beginning, you don't care so much about value uh, and you just spend a lot of money playing games. So not taking into account, for example, pirated games, which is still an issue, but in general, you buy games, uh, for example, through online distribution as a disc or something like that. And uh, then you play for a very long time, you invest time, you invest uh, like money but um, you don't have much influence on what the next steps for the game are. How long inevitable will it be? How, how sustainable? Uh, business models in games are super single-minded usually. And this you can see like you have really nice content. Uh, let's have a good example is for example, Cyberpunk 2077, where you have like cutting edge, really uh, bleeding edge design technology, everything is really the latest and greatest. And people were anticipating the release of this game for maybe almost 10 years or so. And at the end of the day, it was the first game which was ever pulled out of an app store. <laughs> and this was mainly driven by um, the unhappiness factor of the community. So yeah, I, these are I like- I was anticipating it, by the way. I was one of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, what this shows is uh, there's a disparity, um, not only between the web two and web three, that's easy to spot, but also between um, how much risk have people to take in advance to create something which is really cool? But how big is the real risk at the end that the community doesn't like it or maybe it doesn't work well enough and so on. And even if the, the budgets skyrocket, yeah, we are now like with seven, eight digits easily, even with indie games, they are like touching these budgets. And uh, still the fundraising in most of the cases is something like where in advance, a big entity spends like a pile of money into a team for an idea and at the end of n amounts of time <laughs> you get like maybe market proof or not so uh, there are kind of like various perspectives of how you can see this or so there's like downsides for the player they cannot take away much play to earn is going to fix this of course but there's always also like uh, it's a tough time for for game creators as well because uh, for them there's at the moment not so much incentive really to to make this 
or re renovate this. Yeah, fundraising is coming in. People control somehow like the outcome of the business model. Like, yeah, just maximize the daily active users, monetize them. Of course, like now with pay to earn, we have some uh, additional benefits for the players. But and this I said before many times already. This doesn't really drive people to to build new model, business models. For example, something which is running inside of the game and so on. So all of these things together uh, brought me to the conclusion like we have to change the way uh, people get fundraising. And uh, but if you only build this, then you just solve like the kind of like I need liquidity problem. But also if you want uh, to contribute or to, to have the community become like a real active stakeholder, then NFTs or portable assets aren't enough. The community creates even content inside of games. Look at, for example, League of Legends and so on. And therefore, like it's fair to say that uh, these two parties really have to grow together. And how can they grow together? For this, you need like organizational structures which can reflect, for example, uh, many to many relationships of people and so on. And what kind of systems are offered nowadays, uh, for example, in the software as a service world or in Web2? It's all mainly highly centralized. Okay, maybe your forums where you can converge and discuss things and so on. But all of these things are like islands. Therefore, it's pretty hard to, at the end of the day, uh, bring together all these interests into one tool, which is centralized, doesn't work. With Web3, we have these primitives and are able through money Legos, for example, uh, to assemble new types of protocols and, and functionalities which didn't exist before and now with like all of these equally existing with i mean i can go back to this chart i don't know if you sell it see it um now you have like massive amounts of liquidity being being locked in DAOs in decentralized finance protocols and nfts if you bring all of these together uh, and uh, kind of recompile them to the needs for the video game industry then you gain much more flexibility you increase loyalty you you are able to for example almost completely remove the, the investment risk investors have in advance at the moment. Yeah. So for example, they invest like whatever, uh, eight digits and they know at the end how it will come out. Now we have like mechanisms through DAOs and through community creation uh, and, and discovery to massively reduce this risk. Yeah. And these all these little bits and pieces benefit from each other. So you can assemble all of them. And that's what we do basically with GameDAO is um, to align all of these uh, fragments of ideas and bring this into one reasonable context, which can be used by everyone who's kind of like uh, willing to be an active stakeholder in gaming. No matter if it's a creator, if it's a gamer, if it's just an investor. I mean, investors are super important. And in the future, you don't want to keep out, for example, VCs. This wouldn't really make sense because they have the liquidity the market needs to build better products. But also, we need better ways to govern this amount of money to create better products and maybe leave room for, for new business models, opening things we cannot imagine now. Yeah, yeah. no, that, that's right. And actually we'd like to touch a little bit more on this uh, in a moment, but I think it would be very helpful for people as well to understand a little bit how is the process to, to enter GameDAO. So yeah, maybe to, to also give a little bit of background. So I, one of my dreams is actually to develop a game at some point. So I had basically two dreams when I was a kid. One of them was becoming a football player like any Spanish kid want. That didn't work out. But the second one was actually to to create a game. And I think that that's something that it's possible now. Um, it's what I understand. You can actually participate in the creation of a game, even though you don't have any knowledge on the development of it, uh, like me. Although I have played a number of games and actually have some ideas that could be interesting for those and at the same time I can benefit from his this whole process so maybe taking it from the side of a gamer that simply wants to to invest on in a game and wants to participate in this process how does it work in the platform so wh what do I do yeah actually uh, your your example case is uh, is really interesting because uh, community co-creation is something which is really on the rise in general so and, and there are of course like many levels of how you can achieve this you can become a programmer you can become someone who's for example utilizing tools like minecraft or you can utilize things like for example sandbox and so on and there you're like fully enabled to create the most complex things in increasingly simple fashion yeah but 
uh, it's not for everyone, I understand this. So sometimes maybe you just want to contribute with storytelling or something like this. And uh, no matter what way you choose, you need a way to, to test in the market if your idea is reasonable. Yeah, and this means like if you have an existing game, just like generally speaking, and there's a mechanism where you can let the community decide, for example, by a discovery process, which can be a voting, uh, what kind of ideas are reasonable and resonate with the community. For this, you need a mechanism and voting suits pretty well. So for example, you have uh, inside of a game, there's an, an, a call for um, ideas. Yeah, and you're one of the people who are contributing their idea and the community which already converges there to decide in votings of what's right and not, what is important and what's not. They just upvote, downvote, or for example, stake token on your idea. So depending on the quality of your idea and of course of your uh, following, you are able to make a reasonable impact with your idea and then the idea will kind of flow into the production process. Yeah. And this is something which hmm, to my knowledge not really exists by now, where you have like, uh, usually it's segregated. You have like development teams, they do market analysis and stuff like that. And then they come up with like, yeah, market research shows like we need this and that type of game. So they produce it. And now you have the opportunity to start with a small idea as a creator. You could even start a DAO just with your idea. And if it resonates because people see a real reason to play this, then they will come in with liquidity and this will increase your, at the end, your purchase power and you are able to afford like kick-ass developers and uh, visual artists and storytellers, which improve your cool idea and make it even better. And so step-by-step, step, a game can be just growing with the market and together with the community. So that's the other direction. Yeah. So instead of like, you have a team which have something existing, you can extend this idea with votings and, or you come up with an idea and start something totally new. It's also possible. At the end, you all of these participants need kind of liquidity and this is, Basically, the other dimension in game DAO is so you have your treasury pot inside of this DAO for the project, and how you spend the treasury is governed by the DAO members. Okay. Also, yeah. Oh yeah. So that, that's very interesting. So let's say that I come up for an idea for a game. That's something that I can post myself into game DAO, and I can create a DAO around it as well. And then if other people like that idea, they kind of start joining that. And some people can also invest in that, right? So, or yeah, they yeah. can contribute to that. And who can contribute to it? Like, do you need large amounts of funding to be part of this or anyone can, can join it? How does it work? Yeah, actually, you don't need uh, a big amount of money. Um, we have a kind of like flexible um, yeah, token strategy in that regard. Yeah? So uh, the amount of token you need to, uh, to utilize uh, so we have this, uh, we have a governance token and it is used for, for access and, and for governance. Uh, so this means, uh, access means what type of protocols are you able to use? Yeah, and if you use something very complex, for example, in the future, you want to do something which is based on shares and so on, then of course you might need more token. But if you start with a simple idea, you don't need much. You just start your DAO. You can start immediately to market test yeah, because there's already existing community, you can leverage other channels and uh, market your idea. And then people will just come into your DAO and become a participant. At a certain point, when you believe you have like enough traction, then you start a fundraiser inside of this DAO. And people will contribute uh, liquidity into your treasury. Afterwards, or basically before you start your fundraiser, you decide what type of outcome do you expect if you complete your funding goal. Yeah, so for example, you do a simple fundraiser or what I said before with rage quitting, then um, this means in the beginning, you make a rough plan with certain milestones. Uh, so people have a rough idea of how you are planning to, to realize your, your idea. And so they contribute funds. And when the uh, cap is reached, uh, people will always judge what you deliver. So for example, you have like four stages, like you want to write a nice story then you do a graphical prototype of some functionality and so on. And uh, then people see like uh, you don't deliver anything, then they're able to exit from the fundraiser afterwards as well. So the people will get back the funds they invested in you. Yeah, I think th that's very interesting because Robbie was 
saying in the panel before that uh, some of the issues in the gaming industry is actually that uh, game creators incentives and the incentives of the user are not aligned. But here, basically, it's the same it's because the creator and, and the user, to some extent, are the same people and the user can actually uh, change or affect what the, the decisions that the creator makes on this way. So this is a step towards that. Yeah, definitely. So, but uh, we bring it directly into the, so we align the people on the organizational level already versus like, but that's a cool thing about play to earn. Of course, there's like a lot of monetary upside for people participating in these games, but uh, still it takes a long way until uh, the impact, until you can feel the impact as a creator. And here it's very direct because uh, people can directly influence your decisions. I mean, it's up to you how much you want to, for example, uh, obey to these uh, directions. Yeah, maybe people come up with, I don't know, sometimes people have stupid ideas and you don't want to do this, but they have, for example, uh, whatever, aggregated a lot of people who think the same. So either you reflect on that and um, uh, yeah, follow this, uh, this direction or you say like, no, it doesn't really make sense. And it's basically a bit up to you how much of uh, this community direction do you want to integrate. Yeah, Marco, that's that's great actually. And I would uh, continue talking about this forever. And I'm actually <laughs> really looking forward to create or try to create a game in, in the GameDAO platform and also to contribute to others. That actually maybe helps me realize uh, my dream to some extent. Uh, but one last question for you would be, um, so when can people join this? So when is this going to be live and people will be able to create these campaigns uh, and join them? When's that going to be? Um, yeah, we're looking at the second quarter of next year for the go live. This means like uh, the public availability for everyone who is looking to, uh, to uh, yeah, create games, uh, fund them somehow to coordinate them and so on. And currently we're like in a, in a private beta. We are uh, collecting invites for the public beta, which will start this month. This means like uh, during this time, we are incentivizing, of course, people and rewarding them for contributing there as well, because we are a DAO. Therefore, like our core primitive is really like to listen to the community and integrate the community feedback into our product roadmap. This means uh, for us, uh, the, the beta version will open the next days. Therefore, we're collecting people through our newsletter on the gamedao.co webpage. And um, everyone who's on the newsletter will receive an invite uh, to this beta. And later on, it will open up towards the public uh, go live. And um, the go live will be on Akala Network. That's a Polkadot parachain for those who don't know. Uh, Polkadot is a kind of like multi chain ecosystem. Uh, so, yeah. Great, Marco. So it means that we can start working with you very soon. So, you know, everyone go to gamedao.co. I think someone can put it in the chat now as well for everyone to see it. But Marco, that was great. Thank you very much. Really looking forward to be able to join the platform. And now we're moving to the next one, which I think actually we're going to be talking about biomedicine. See everyone. Thanks, Thank you for joining. Thanks for having me. Bye.